Okay. Thank you, James. Thank you, Magic. Um, it's always one of my favorite simulations, the, uh, the uh, tumor growth modeling. It's very cool stuff. So very glad to be back with all of you. Um, going to start back in on cellularization of our viral infection ODE model. <clears throat> Today we're going to um, do um, some modeling work and play with some plugins um, related to uh, the motility of the immune cells that we um, added into our simulation um, in the last module that I had the pleasure of doing with all of you. Um, so we're going to start right in on this uh, today. Uh, this module, we're going to work specifically with random motility, uh, which Magic um, introduced us to um, concerning uh, the POTS model algorithm. We're going to mess with that a little bit today and do some exploration with um, how that affects motility. Um, we're going to do a bit of a crash course on chemotaxis modeling um, and doing translocation of cells um, along gradients of diffusive fields. Uh, and then we have some exercises um, lined up for you to sort of do some experiments with um, what we're going to add into our model today. So for this module, this is labeled as 2.4. So for those of you who would like to start with a fresh copy um, of the code um, or who didn't manage to get through everything from uh, 2.3, you can go back to the student materials and begin fresh. Uh, with the version in the directory module two underscore three dot version three. I'm going to go ahead and load that up. So I'll be starting from this fresh module. You're welcome to do the same or to use the code that you've been developing. Um, I hope that the exercises that left you with from 2.3 were insightful and maybe you uh, noticed some interesting things concerning preferential attachment. I'm going to go ahead and load these simulation scripts in player and Twedit. So if everyone would like to join me here, go ahead and load either module two underscore three or the current version of your cellularized model, go ahead and load those into both player and Twitter. Okay. So let's proceed then. Up to here, this is what we've done so far concerning the ODE model. There's a little bit left to do. Um, when completing the cellularized version, um, but we've done our epithelial sheet, they're experiencing the viral life cycle, um, internalization to um, replication, release, um, back into the extracellular space for continued um, infection. Infected cells do inflammatory signaling. Uh, signaling now is a form of communication between our local site of infection and our spatial domain and our compartmental model of a lymph node that we added in our last module. And as a consequence, uh, there are uh, immune cells that proliferate um, in our lymph node compartmental model and then eventually get sent back to our local, local site of infection using all of our inflow and outflow um, algorithmic calculations that we Im implemented in module 2.3. So now that we have modal immune cells, let's do some surveys and a little bit of work on what we can do to affect how they move. So as Magic described uh, yesterday, in our final module of the day yesterday, um, the cellular dynamics algorithm um, that's behind CompuCell, called either the cellular POTS model or the CPM, um, or the GGH model, um, but in general, the cellular dynamics model that's used in CompuCell 3D is a stochastic lattice-based model. And as Magic went through, um, there is a probability that's assigned 
to some spin flips or some copy attempts, depending on the terminology that you prefer, when deciding whether or not cell sites copy themselves over to neighboring copy sites. And as Matrick described, um, when some system effective um, energy or Hamiltonian decreases due to that change, um, that copy is always accepted, whereas if it increases the total system effective energy, then there's a probability that it still occurs, but that probability decreases proportionally with the increase in the total effective system energy. That expression is shown here. And in particular, um, there is this parameter in the equation for that probability. It's noted here as T sub M. And this parameter strongly affects the stochasticity of the cellular dynamics. Often called temperature, um, I think there were some questions about this yesterday, um, and we're going to go through this a little bit today and see this in action, but um, it's certainly a misnomer to call it temperature, but it's sort of a legacy thing that the XML tag is still in here, but what you can do is think of it in terms of temperature in the sense that when this parameter temperature, which is the coefficient shown in this expression for the probability, when this temperature is higher, there'll be more randomness in the cellular dynamics. Now, let's go through and find this in our code. So in Twedit, I'm going to go into the XML, so glaziermodel.xml, and you can navigate down to this block of code and the provided code. It starts at around line 9, goes to around line 17. It's also what's shown here um, on the left-hand side of my screen. This is the area where um, we previously uh, prescribed boundary conditions for um, our cellular uh, lattice domain, um, number of simulation steps, and the size of the domain. And then at around line 13 in the provided code, there's the entry for temperature. And this is where this can be specified. Now, this is standard in all CompuCell uh, simulations. Um, I think that is always initialized with a default value of 10 using um, wizard. Um, now we're going to see what that does just a little bit. So before we do any actual coding, let's, let's start with an exercise. Um, we're going to add in a little bit of test code into our steppable so that we can play with that parameter um, and observe what sort of effects it has on the cellular dynamics. So we move to glazier model steppables.py. We're going to go down into our steppable. And we're going to navigate to the end of our start function. So just before the beginning, of our steppables step function. Working in the provided code, we'll be working just after line 251. Should find some code for plotting um, data points and death data window. We're gonna go after that code, just before the step function, we're gonna create a little space. And we're going to Start our simulation. Again, we'll have an epithelial sheet. In the simulations we did at the end of module 2.3, we saw that um, the simulation doesn't start with any local immune cells, but rather they're recruited um, due to signaling. Well, let's create a test code block. And we're going to start our simulation by also initializing one local immune cell at the center of our lattice on top of our epithelial sheet. We can do this in the code snippet shown to the left. Um, none of this is uh, new material, so we can just blast right through this. 
um, quite quickly. If you want to follow along with me, let's create a new cell. We'll do this we'll cell equals self dot new cell. And our cell type as a reminder is CDA local all caps. And we're going to assign parameters for our volume plugin. As a reminder, there are two parameters, one being the target volume, cell.target volume, and our model input for the ODE model spatialization was cell underscore volume. The second parameter is lambda volume. So cell.lambda volume. And that is equal to the model input for our cellularized version, which was volume underscore LM. And now that we've created our new cell, let's find a little space at the center of the lattice and place it there. This is shown in the code snippet again on the left side, left hand side of my screen. This is just finding the center point of the lattice as Z equals to one and then setting that site equal to our newly created cell. So let's do that. So to access the cell field again, the self.cell underscore field. Uh, indexing into that lattice needs to be integers. So our calculation will be passed into the Python function int. And it's into self.dim.x, the x dimension of our lattice, minus the size of our cell, just cell diameter. It's a model input again. We'll divide that by two. So int of half of cell.dim.x minus cell diameter. So that's one half of our cell diameter positioned at the center point. And then let's do the other half. Int of self.dim.x plus cell diameter over two. And then if you've noticed the pattern, let's do that for the y dimension as well. Self.dim.y minus cell diameter. Divided by two, I'm going to do that through self.dim.y plus cell diameter. And z equals to one. So that'll centrally place one immune cell. In our lattice on top of the epithelial sheet, if we set that equal to cell. <clears throat> now, we're going to do some measurements of where our cell goes. Then we're going to do this across steppable functions. Uh, initialize this in the start function and then we're going to reference it in the step function. So let's store a reference to our newly created cell and we'll call that self.test cell. Self.test cell equals cell, our newly created cell. And the measurement that we're going to take is the distance traveled by the cell in simulation. And to make that calculation, we're going to need to know where it was initially placed. We're going to make these measurements with respect to the center of mass of the cell. And this is an attribute that's maintained by CompuCell automatically. This has been reviewed in a previous module. So we're going to store those coordinates as well. This, the coordinates of our cell where it's initially placed, we'll call those coordinates self.init underscore x for the x coordinate. And that can be accessed from the cell as cell.xcom, where com is capitalized, all caps, 
And likewise, let's store the initial y coordinate of the center of mass as self dot init underscore y for initial y. And that is equal to cell dot y com. Now, if everyone's there, we've got our test case set up, created one cell during initialization, one immune cell. We placed it centrally at, uh, in the lattice on top of our epithelial sheet. And then we recorded what that cell is so that we can access it when doing calculations. And we also recorded the initial coordinates of the cell's center of mass. All right, so let's continue. To make these measurements, let's now move down a couple of lines and let's go to into our step function. And before anything that's already in the step function, let's make a little bit of space. So the provided code the step function starts at around line 262. You can return a couple of times and make a little space. And let's do a calculation of the distance traveled at each simulation step. The distance traveled currently by our cell with respect to its initial center of mass. Now the code snippet is shown here on the left hand side of my screen. We're going to calculate the squared distance first. We call that variable dist2 for distance squared. And that is equal to the square of the difference of the current center of mass and the initial center of mass. And that expression goes as follows. Start some parentheses and take the distance along the x direction self dot, and we're gonna measure with respect to our test cell, test underscore cell dot x com, its current center of mass. And take the difference with the initial x coordinate, the center of mass, self dot init dot x, which we stored at line 259 in the provided code. And take the square of that, and then do the same for the y coordinate. Parentheses self dot test underscore cell dot y com minus self dot, and then our initial y coordinate init underscore y and square it. There's a question in the chat from JR about where the lecture slides are stored. And Juliano has just made sure that that is in the student folder. So those of you who'd like a copy of this to work at your own pace or if you get behind or don't want to wait on me, um, you can find those, these slides there. Okay, so we have our distance squared measurement for this simulation step. Now let's um, also record the difference between the cells volume and its target volume. So if you recall from module 2.3, this is a calculation that's made in the volume plugin. So the effective energy used in the volume plugin is the square of the difference between the cell's current volume and its target volume. So let's measure that as well. Let's do a variable called vol underscore diff for volume difference, and we'll just say that that's equal to the difference of self dot test underscore cell dot volume, test cell's current volume, minus its target volume, cell dot, or self dot test underscore cell dot target volume. And that's the target volume specified for this cell. <clears throat> and lastly, let's print our measurements. 
Just use the Python command print, start some parentheses, start a quotation so we can print what step we're measuring. So we'll say in quotes, step, space, and then a comma. We're just going to print the current step and then our two measurements. Step and then comma MCS for the current simulation step. Let's take the square root of our square distance measurement. Square root of dist2. Or you can just do dist2, either way. And then our volume difference, ball underscore diff. So now at every simulation step, this is going to print the current simulation step, which is MCS. It's going to print the distance, the current distance of the cell from its initial starting location. And it's also going to print the difference between its current volume and its volume constraint target volume. Meaning that if that measurement is negative, then the cell is currently undersized. And if it's positive, then it's oversized. All right, now if everyone's there, let's do our first exercise. Let's go to our XML, so blazermodel.xml. And what I'd like you to do is take five minutes and play with the temperature input in the POTS XML element. So start by changing the temperature to one, go over to player and run it, and observe your measurements for maybe a hundred steps or so. And then stop your simulation, restart it with temperature set to 10, watch the measurements, repeat, and do that with 20 as well. And then observe how um, those two measurements will change. So let's take five minutes and go ahead and do that. Uh, while we're going through this, um, I'll also, also answer a question in the chat, which was to review what the actual temperature is. So I'll just jump back while we're going through and observing how the temperature changes our cell's behavior. So moving back a couple of slides, the expression shown here, this is the probability of a copy occurring where in the cellular POTS model, the cellular dynamics algorithm of CompuCell, this is the probability of a cell copying itself to a neighboring site in the case where the change increases the total effective energy of the system. And in particular, the parameter temperature as annotated in the XML the value that's input here is the coefficient t underscore m in this probability expression. And the consequential effect is that for higher values of temperature, 
the stochasticity of the cellular dynamics will increase. So you see more surface fluctuations, more randomness, and that's due to the coefficient t underscore m reducing the um, effect or the magnitude, uh, I'm sorry, reducing the um, effect of the magnitude of the increase in system effective energy. So higher temperatures means more surface fluctuations and more stochasticity. Lower values mean less surface fluctuations, less stochasticity. And just as an example of this, um, if you refer to my screen and my simulation, I set my temperature equal to one. It was originally set to 10. I reduced it down to one, and I have some immune cells in my um, simulation at this point. So some immune cells have been recruited, but I noticed that they're not moving, at least not very much. And that's due to having decreased the uh, input to this XML um, entry, reducing this by a factor of 10 down to one. Got about 50 seconds or so left. While everyone's working, I'm going to go ahead and do the last variation, which is increasing the temperature up to 20. I'm going to run mine again. I have my test cell, and it is clearly behaving differently now. It's very modal, lots of surface fluctuations. And when I look at my terminal, Well, my cell has now been annihilated. And you may have experienced that as well. Why that occurred, I'm actually not exactly sure. But we can go ahead and come back from our exercise now. What you should notice in particular is when observing the differences in the measurements for a very low temperature, the difference in the volume, which is our second measurement being printed, you also just notice it by watching the field. For a low temperature, the volume difference doesn't change very much. It does change, just not very often, whereas when increasing the input for the temperature to 20, you start getting lots of surface fluctuations. And you can observe that by watching lots of fluctuations in the difference in the volume. So they may not be big fluctuations, the difference may not um, be changing to particularly large values, but the value itself should be changing a lot and most certainly a lot more um, as compared to when the temperature was set to one. A uh, question in the chat about um, where code is located um, with this completed. Um, the final version of this module can be found in, um, it'll be called module underscore 2.4, version four. So that is the outcome of this entire module. Um, so if you want to just grab that, if you've fallen behind, feel free. Um, that'll already have our next um, bit of exercises implemented as well. Um, but you can uh, disable those and go through these um, on your own if uh, it's of particular interest to you. So let's come back and let's go to Twedit and let's put our temperature back to what it originally was, which was 10.
Now let's move on to chemotaxis. So at a very high level, chemotaxis is cells moving in response to a chemical gradient, meaning that in space, the amount of a chemical changes. You look at one point and then you look at another point and you compare um, the measurements at two different locations, there will be a difference. And chemotaxis is the migration of cells either up or down a chemical gradient. And by up or down, what I mean is that if it moves up a gradient, then the cell is attracted to higher values of a chemical concentration, whereas if it moves down, then it goes towards lower values. And we often refer to that as um, the fields being chemoattractants or chemorepellents, respectively, meaning that where there are higher values of a chemical concentration, um, you're more likely to find cells there. And if a cell can detect a gradient, it will travel along that gradient towards the higher value of the chemical field. Now, one of the aspects of chemotaxis that we're going to implement uh, in our cellularized model, and this is one that's presented some interesting results in previous work using CompuCell, uh, which is called contact inhibited chemotaxis, meaning that um, when a cell goes to chemotax, it can only chemotax into available space. So if a cell detects a gradient, it'll begin to um, undergo processes associated with um, cell polarity and rearrangement of the cytoskeleton, so on and so forth, but it'll only do this towards locations that are not currently occupied by a cell. So that the interactions at a contact interface between two cells would prohibit chemotaxis. Whereas at contact surfaces where there aren't any cells, then all of the biological processes necessarily for chemotaxis are um, able to be accomplished um, for the cell to start migrating. Now, one of the complications associated with modeling chemotaxis is that Typically when we model chemical fields um, using reaction diffusion equations, um, values uh, of a chemical field can vary over um, a, a very wide uh, range of orders of magnitude, meaning that um, place a cell in a chemical field in simulation, it's possible that it could experience values, um, you know, say 50,000 times greater um, than the minimum in the field, um, in which case it's possible then that if you associate a force that acts on the cell due to the chemical gradient, and this expression is shown here in the bottom left, this is linear chemotactic forces, this is just a direct correlation, the force applied on a cell is a function of the gradient. If we choose our parameters um, at some value and the cell then experiences chemical concentrations that are very large with respect to our parameter of choice, then it's possible for the cell to get torn apart. It can either get crushed um, or it can be um, torn apart into tiny little fragments. Uh, this is more uh, a numerical and modeling issue than, than anything else. Um, and so the chemotactic model that we tend to use is shown in the bottom right of my screen, which is a logarithmic chemotactic force, which is that when we take a measurement of our chemical gradient, and we have some modeling parameter that maps um, the chemical gradient that a cell is experiencing onto the force that's applied. We'll take our parameter and we'll normalize it by one plus the concentration, say, at the center of mass of the cell. This is a way to downscale um, the magnitudes um, of the concentration field itself and instead uh, apply a more um, consistent 
um, effect due to the gradient itself as opposed to the particular magnitude of the field. So this is the chemotactic rule that we're going to apply um, when we implement chemotaxis into our model. So let's do it. We're going to continue with the idea that the cytokine um, released by our infected and our virus releasing cells um, acts upon recruitment of our immune cells and say that along with signaling to our lymph node um, compartmental model that our cytokine field also acts as a chemoattractant and that when our, one of our local immune cells that's been recruited due to global cytokine signaling when one of our local cells experiences a gradient of cytokine, it'll also chemotax along that gradient to find an, a, an infected or virus-releasing cell. So let's do that here. Let's start in the XML. Go to glazermodel.xml, and we're going to add our chemotaxis plugin. So this is a plugin that's uh, standard in CompuCell. We're not going to spend much time on a lot of the details of it, though in a moment I'll provide a link to the documentation for your reference so you can look at some of um, the finer details of the plugin. Uh, for now, let's uh, just say go down to our pixel tracker plugin around like line 63 or so. Let's make a little space and get our cursor on an empty line. And then in the Twedit menu bar, let's go to CC3D ML. This is a plugin, so let's go to plugins and then chemotaxis. So on an empty line in the XML, we're going to go to CC3D ML, and then plugins, and then click chemotaxis. While everyone is completing that, We'll add into the chat a link to the full documentation on the Chemotaxis plugin because there are some interesting additional features to this um, that you can review on your own time. I don't want to slow us down on too many finer details. Now, Twedit will generate a code snippet for our Chemotaxis plugin. And you can see that there are some template code snippets that have been generated um, for specific modeling um, options for the Chemotaxis plugin. Um, again, these are documented in the documentation. I encourage you to go um, to the documentation at the link that I posted in the chat to see some more details on that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to manage all of our Chemotaxis in Python much of these codes, these code snippets that have been added are for automatic chemotaxis management in uh, the C++ uh, engine behind CompuCell. We're going to do it all manually in Python, in which case all we need in our chemotaxis plugin is this one entry or chemical field. You can see the final code snippet on the left-hand side of my screen. I've done a little bit of removal of the automatically generated code snippets. I'm just going to cut this down a little bit and clean it up. So this one tag, chem, chemical field, and we have an attribute here called name. This is where we specify what fields in the diffusion solver will be used in our Chemotaxis plugin. So we'll tell Chemotaxis about the fields. We can do this with multiple fields. We'll tell the Chemotaxis plugin which fields from the diffusion solver we're going to use in our Chemotaxis modeling. In this case, we're just going to use cytokine. You can go down to the XML for the diffusion solver and copy the name, or you can just write it manually. 
we're going to add this into our entry for chemical field or its name. If you've reduced this to one line like I have in the XML, just make sure that you add a slash um, before your terminating bracket. Now Chemotaxis knows to look for Chemotaxis information associated with the cytokine field. Question in the chat about the lambda in the Chemotaxis model. The question is, what is lambda representative of? And Giuliano answers this well. You can think of this as the strength. We're going to do an exercise or two on this. I'm going to move back a couple of slides very quickly. So this force for the logarithmic chemotactic force, um, this lambda um, that we will specify as a model input and then normalize, this lambda you can absolutely think of as a strength. So if this value is zero, then there is no chemotactic force. If the lambda is excessively high, then um, perhaps generating a force that annihilates the cell due to the chemical gradient. So much, much like our volume uh, plug-in parameter for the strength of the volume constraint, this is very, very similar, has the same basic principle. Now, let's continue. If everyone's with me on updating the XML, let's go over to glazier model steppables.py. Going to go up to the very top and add a model input and appropriately so let's add our model input for our lambda the strength of chemotaxis i'm going to add mine under the decay or the diffusion coefficient for cytokine i'm going to add a comment letting others know what this is for i'm going to call it just lambda chemotaxis and the variable just call it lambda underscore chemotaxis. Let's set that equal to one E5. So lambda underscore chemotaxis equals one E5 somewhere at the top in the model inputs. Moving on, we're gonna go down into our step function. We're gonna implement manually managing the chemotaxis plugin in our steppable. So in our steppable, let's navigate down to our step function. And to do our logarithmic chemotactic force, what we're going to do is we're going to get the uh, local cytokine value for each cell, and we're gonna normalize our model input parameter lambda chemotaxis so that our cells don't, or are less, are less likely to get annihilated um, due to chemotactic forces. So let's go down to where we did our immune recruitment yesterday. In the provided code, it should be around line 324. That's where it starts. And it should end at around line 373, which is where secretion starts. Before secretion, let's make a little space. So after updating our immune cell population data windows, so on and so forth, let's add a little space and let's start a new section with a comment. Let's say update chemotaxis. So the comment, update chemotaxis, and break it up by module and annotations um, like I've done by starting this comment with step colon. Now let's return from there a couple of times. And again, what we would like to do is we'd like to go over every immune cell in our simulation. And we would like to inform the chemotaxis plugin about the local amount of cytokine to enforce this logarithmic chemotactic rule. So let's begin by starting a loop over all of our local immune cells. 
Uh, you can do this with uh, the Twedit uh, code generator for um, visiting. So in CC3D Python, visit, and then all cells of given type. Can erase the code that was generated um, for comments and pass just one argument to self.cell list by type, which is our cell type that we would like to loop over. And that's CDA local, all caps. So for cell and self dot cell list by type, and passing self dot CDA local. Now to tell Chemotaxis plugin, um, about the actual strength, as we're now calling it, the strength of chemotaxis. We can do this on the basis of cells. We'll go through and inform chemotaxis plugin every simulation step for every immune cell what the current total value of the strength of chemotaxis is. Again, using the logarithmic uh, chemotaxis expression. And we can do this by uh, getting what's called chemotaxis data. And we can get one of these for each individual cell. And the chemotaxis data will contain the information um, for setting uh, the strength of chemotaxis. So the code snippet is shown here on the left. We're going to start this by getting a chemotaxis data for each cell in our cell list. Just going to call this variable cd for chemotaxis data. Say cd equals self dot, and the reference to chemotaxis plugin is chemotaxis plugin, where p is capitalized. And then the function is get chemotaxis data. The c and d for chemotaxis and data, respectively, are capitalized. And then we pass two arguments. First is the cell that we would like to get the chemotaxis data for. And the second argument is a string of the name of the field that we would like to get chemotaxis data for. So again, we can specify chemotaxis data for multiple fields being solved by the, the diffusion solvers. This gets the chemotaxis data for our particular cell and our particular field. It's possible to do chemotaxis with multiple fields. This is how to get the data for a cell and a field. So now that we have our chemotaxis data for this cell and our cytokine field, let's return twice. Now we want to get the concentration of the cytokine field at the center of mass of our cell. And then as shown in the code snippet, according to our logarithmic chemotaxis, we're going to set the actual strength of chemotaxis using this function set lambda. So this is the strength of chemotaxis for our cell and the cytokine field. We can set the current lambda value for our cell and this field. So let's start by getting the concentration of cytokine at the center of mass of the cell. We can do this by declaring a variable, say concentration. And we can index directly into the cytokine field with self.field.cytokine. And then at our coordinates, cell.xcom, cell.ycom, and z equals to 1 in the immune cell layer. So that's the cytokine value at the center of mass. And then we can update our lambda. That's CD, or our chemotaxis data, and then the function set lambda to set lambda for chemotaxis. And our expression is our model input, lambda chemotaxis, and then divided by one plus our concentration value. And that'll be the lambda value for chemotaxis for this cell and cytokine for the next simulation step.
Now, lastly, our last bit of code development. Since we're managing chemotaxis data in Python and we're doing it manually, that means that we have to initialize chemotaxis data. This is done automatically um, if working with C++ with the uh, built-in functionality. Um, but to do this in Python, um, we can manage it manually and it's fairly straightforward. Um, now we're adding immune cells dynamically due to immune cell recruitment, which means that we need to test to make sure that each immune cell actually has chemotaxis data. The reason we have to check again is because we're man managing it manually. And the way that we can test to make sure that the cell in our loop actually has chemotaxis data to do anything, we can test to see if the returned chemotaxis data is none. If the cell doesn't have chemotaxis data for the field that we've specified, then the return CD will be none. And what that corresponds to in our algorithm is that this is a new immune cell that's been added during recruitment that hasn't yet had its chemotaxis data initialized. So let's start a block to handle this. We're going to start this uh, with a conditional and say that if CD is none, which is to say if this cell doesn't have chemotaxis data yet. So if CD is none, then you can return to start a new level of indentation in our if block. Let's continue. Now if our local immune cell doesn't have chemotaxis data, then we need to assign it. And we can do that. The code snippet is shown on the left-hand side of my screen with one line, which is another function from Chemotaxis plugin. And that function is add Chemotaxis data. Now this will also return Chemotaxis data as well, so we can work with what's returned by this. We can just say that for this new cell, the CD equals self.chemotaxis plugin dot add chemotaxis data. And just like with get chemotaxis data, we want to pass the cell that we're adding chemotaxis data to and the field, which in our case again is cytokine in a string. So cd equals self.chemotaxis plugin dot add chemotaxis data past the cell that needs the chemotaxis data then pass the name of our field cytokine. Let's return. And now let's do one more fancy feature from chemotaxis plugin, which is we'll implement contact inhibited chemotaxis, which is to say that chemotaxis is only applied towards sites occupied by the medium. So if we don't enter this second line that's shown in my code snippet, then chemotaxis will be applied at all contact interfaces. Now if we pass a list of different cell types, including the medium, self.medium, self.infected, so on and so forth, whatever elements are listed in this list that's being passed is where chemotaxis will actually occur for our immune cell. So in this case, let's do complete contact inhibited chemotaxis and just say that the cell can only chemotax towards the medium, in which case we can use a function on the chemotaxis data, which is cd.assign chemotax towards vector types. Sign chemotax towards vector types. And let's start a Python list with some brackets and just enter self.medium, all caps. So this cell will only chemotax towards the medium. And that's it.
So try to get chemotaxis data for one of our local immune cells. If it doesn't have it yet, then we initialize it for our cytokine field. Tell chemotaxis plug in that chemotaxis only occurs towards the medium to model contact inhibited chemotaxis. And we get the concentration of the cytokine field at the cell's center of mass to normalize the strength of chemotaxis using logarithmic chemotaxis. Question in the chat, can this be assigned when you start the model in the wizard? Um, the chemotaxis plugin uh, can be automatically generated in the XML according to what you specify in the wizard. So if you check the box for chemotaxis, then a little code snippet like what was generated automatically in Twedit, that'll also be um, in the XML that's automatically generated, but uh, more well-tuned to um, the other specifications um, that you make in Wizard. Um, as far as doing this sort of management manually in Python, this is not automatically generated um, in Wizard. Okay, so chemotaxis is done. So we're gonna fly through some of these exercises very quickly. Um, Let's go back up to our model inputs and go to our lambda chemotaxis. Value is set to 1E5. Let's set that to 1E7. Around line 24, if you're following with me. Lambda chemotaxis equals 1E7. Set that, load it up into player and run it and see how it looks. Let's take a couple of minutes. If your initial cell gets annihilated, no worries. Just give it a minute for your other immune cells to show up and you can see them start moving around. I have a typo in my code, no problem. Now, when your cell gets going and chemotaxis starts really kicking in, you ought to be able to look back at the measurements that are being printed. And you ought to see that your measurement for distance um, starts increasing drastically. You also notice some numerical and modeling issues um, for this high of a lambda chemotaxis value where fragmentation can occur, as Magic um, discussed yesterday um, in the numerical aspects of um, the cellular dynamics of POTS model. Create an additional window and maybe look at the cytokine field, just depending on how those gradients look. If you want to make the effects really exaggerated, you can do things like decreasing the diffusion coefficient of the cytokine. Um, that leads to stronger gradients um, due to release um, by virus releasing cells. At this point in my simulation, everything is already either infected or virus releasing, so nearly everything is um, releasing cytokine. So at this point, now that the cytokine field is approximately what we would call flat, meaning that nearly everywhere, well, that everywhere the value is nearly the same. Now there's really no directional information. I mean, there are really no notable uh, gradients um, in the spatial distribution of 
the cytokine field. So there's really not much information for the immune cells to use um, to find infected cells. But all the same with this exaggerated uh, value of lambda chemotaxis equal to 1E7, still definitely see cells elongating um, in really high gradients with this value, um, even with logarithmic chemotaxis, uh, can become possible to start seeing um, effects like what I see here in my simulation right now, which is fragmentation, maybe even a little higher, can actually get some ripping of cells into tiny little bits. Okay. Give everyone another, say, minute, minute and a half. Any debugging that anyone uh, might need to do, feel free. Take a little more time. I'll move my slide back to the code snippet in case anyone's doing any last minute debugging. In the chat, Peter mentions that his cell disappeared and that the simulation failed when disk two got too large. Yep, so this is a uh, um, a computational issue, more of a, a programming issue than anything. Um, um, again, I uh, admittedly am not exactly sure why that cell is disappearing, um, which is fine. You know, there's a lot going on here, so things like that happen. Um, probably the easiest way to deal with that, just for very quick reference, um, if you know that it's problematic that this calculation, um, if we know that this calculation is problematic when the cell disappears, then we just put a condition on our measurement that says that if our test cell's volume is greater than zero, then make the measurement and print it. So if the cell's volume is zero, that means it's been annihilated and it's gone. That apparently is problematic, so only do these measurements and printing of the measurement when the cell is still in the domain. Okay, give everyone another 30 seconds or so. Hopefully we're all moving steadily towards the same point in our code. See uh, in the chat, I'm getting an error that says that cell G object has no attribute XCOM. Cell G refers to the class of the cell objects in CombiCell 3D. Um, no attribute XCOM with all caps. Make sure that your XCOM has a lowercase x and an uppercase C, O, and M. So it's lowercase x, and then capital C, capital O, capital M for center of mass. Those are my favorite bugs, the easy ones. Okay, so I'm going to push us forward on this. Again, these slides are available. Um, the finished version of this code is also available. Um, so I'm going to push us towards the finish line because we have lots of other great content um, to get today. Um, yes, as James point, uh, points out, Python does care about capitalization. Um, 
So this was the exercise that we completed, setting lambda chemotaxis equals to 1E7. Let's go ahead and reverse that change before we move on. And just put that back to 1E5. Now there are a couple more exercises. I think just, yeah, two more exercises um, that are shown here in the slides. I would like to send you off to do those on your own. Um, but I will summarize the outcomes um, very quickly so you can get a better sense of this. Um, you'll find when you do um, this exercise and set lambda chemotaxis equal to something like 1E12, which is an absurdly high um, value for um, chemotaxis, uh, you'll find that cells end up annihilated. They end up getting ripped into tiny little shreds and then they get crushed. Um, and so when you simulate that, you try that out and observe it. Um, and then I'd like to send you off, um, particularly with the thought um, of asking yourself how you could potentially counteract chemotaxis that in general is too strong. Based on what we've um, covered with MAGIC on um, the POTS formalism in general and the work that we've done with, um, say, the volume plugin, um, contact plugin and random motility. Um, maybe think about as you're playing with that and destroying yourselves with chemotactic forces, what you could potentially do um, to mitigate that besides just turning down the strength of chemotaxis. I have a note here at the very end to just remove um, the um, test code to make our first initial cell. Um, if you're just going to be migrating to the next module version, um, then you don't have to worry about doing this. If you've been incrementally building the same code um, as we progress through the modules, then I'd like to um, just remind you to remove the test code um, that we added at the end of the start function and the beginning of the step function. We're not going to use that um, in future modules. Now with that, I'd like to turn it back to James.